Well, hello. Hello. Officially, welcome. How are y'all feeling? Good. Good. Um, I am not the speaker, but I am excited to be here to introduce the speaker, who is a dear friend and colleague and um, one of the most dynamic people uh, in terms of helping empower women lead well and lead from a really authentic place. Uh, this lovely lady's name, if you didn't already read it in the program, is Dr. Pat Baxter. She is uh, truly remarkable and has worked at Fortune 500 companies, um, including Citibank and Unisys and Deloitte and Touche, and uh, has um, made it through Wall Street, uh, survived all of that, and is an expert in emotional intelligence. And truly from the start of her career, she has committed herself to being that uplifting resource for helping leaders at all levels being the support system that she didn't have when she started her career. And her firm provides coaching and consulting on something that I think um, we all know makes us good leaders, and that is emotional intelligence. The good news is we as women, we tend to do this a little bit better, so we're already starting from a good place. <laughs> she helps teams cope with conflict and build stronger, compassionate, and empathetic interpersonal relationships by helping them look at the emotional aspects of conflict. Um, her first book, Cool Change, right here. I can even hold up the book. Um, Turning Emotions into Leadership Strengths, which I have read. It is very good. I highly recommend it. Um, about hard-won lessons as a woman in a male-dominated world of Wall Street. So yeah, lots of fun stories. <laughs> and she has received praise for the very practical advice that it um, provides. Not just, you know, here's the story, but how can you use this in your own career? And she's got a new book coming out, which is exciting. Um, 101 Ways to Build and Grow Awesome Teams with Emotional Intelligence, which will be out in June, so keep your eyes open for that. And with that, would you please help me welcome Pat Baxter. Thank you, dear. I'm so glad you're here. Well, I've had a chance to, to chat with the whole group and with a couple of the, the individuals here. And so far, so good with the conference. And what I hear, people are coming back to it. So of all the other workshops you could have gone to, why did you pick one on failure? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Sometimes you have to allow people to fail and supporting them and, and even myself and how to come back out of that, the failure to be able to learn the lessons to uh, make them again. So. Okay. So y you learn them and you learn from them and you help other people learn from their, mm -hmm. uh, their mistakes and their failures. What else? What else can you think of? Yes. Hmm? Mm -hmm. so. it, it, confession is good for the soul, you know. I don't think this is something that's talked about very much. Bingo. That's, that's why I'm doing this workshop. That's why I offered to Donna to do this work. Because it's something we don't talk about. And I am so excited mm -hmm. that we can talk about failing yeah. out in the open telling it the way it is, and telling the story of what we have come through and how we are better for failing. And I, I know in this, in this capitalistic society of ours, it's always the winners. You got to win. Who was that? Uh, Baldwin. Kept, it was a Baldwin or some other character on, on TV was saying, winning! And it's what people measure your success by, whether you've won or you've lost. So I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me. Think about one of your failures. Have you got it in your hand? Now I want you to come up with an image that represents that failure. An image that represents that failure. And I want you to tell someone else 
what that image is. Very quickly. Go. What is it? Tell someone. Okay, failure is a very invigorating thing, isn't it? It, it gets us thinking, talking, and going into my world from an emotional perspective, it gets us feeling. So what were some of the images that came up for you when you started to, to think about how do I conceptualize what failure is for me? Go. Uh huh. Can you tell us more about that? Because uh, you need to have some, you need to have the failures, and I was like, okay, it's going to be a part of the goal. Uh, this experience is going to give me something. It's for a reason. So, and it's a part. I'm, I'm getting, I've got to get over the rainbow. Huh. I like that. That because you you have to get over the rainbow or through the rainbow or under the rainbow <laughs> to get to the pot of gold. That's a great visual. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Deep breath. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yes. Tears, tears crying, tear droplets. The, the, yeah. the moment you feel, oh my God, I have I failed somehow, some way. Anyone else? Like, for me, is not able to get up, but want help so that I can get up and get to move. Yeah, yeah. Getting, getting moving again is, is always an issue. Can I show you what my visual is of failure? Come on. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. All right. I'm going to have to go here then. Come on, baby. That feel and look familiar? For me, it, the, the failures, I have, I've had some amazing failures. I've been in business for over 30 years. And as you heard, part of my career was on Wall Street. And as one of the few women in the, depa the department and in my company in technology and Wall Street, I had some epic failures, but personally as well. And people that I've, uh, I've failed, things that I failed to complete. And there is a, a whole feeling around it. And there are, there's a lot of work around this feeling of shame. So there, and there's been a, a lot of work around that. And it's that, that shame that keeps us from talking about what happened to us. And unfortunately, it stops us midway from talking about what we learned from it. With me, a train wreck is I'm totally off the rails. Metal, ever, debris, metal everywhere. And I am once again faced with putting it back together again. And the good news I think about that is that I don't have to put it back into the same shape that I did, that I had before. So getting through that is the first, the first challenge. And one of the things, I've been doing a lot of uh, research and, and work around this, and I coach many, many women and some men. But one of the things I've come to realize is, you know, this isn't something we learn as we're growing in, into adulthood or going to school or anything like that. 
it is embedded in us from when we are babies. Oops. We, when you think about it, when we're babies or with our own babies, when they fall, essentially, clinically, they failed. But what do we do right away? Come on, baby, try again, try again. And we don't keep doing that when we're grown. And that's why some, some individuals um, mean so much to us as we, we grow up and grow through our, uh, our issues and, and our failures. I want to go back to this one. This is my new f philosophy about failure. Failure is a trampoline. You hit it, you go down a little bit, but if you know how to work it, up you go. And you're able to accomplish and go much higher than you ever could have before. So I invite you to think about failure as a trampoline. You go down a little bit, but jump right back up. So let me get back to my baby, my baby, baby, baby. <laughs> now, when we're babies, like I said, we will inc we're encouraged by our parents, by the adults to come and just try again. Come on, I'll help you. It'll be okay. Encouragement, all those things. Um, but sometimes we get messages as we're growing up when we're no longer real babies. And I want to share with you, and one of the things I will do is I will be sharing with you a lot of my learning and uh, what I've learned about failure. This is a much younger me. Aren't I cute? <laughs> Uh, I think I'm in second grade. I actually found this in my dad's wallet. My dad is now 91. And I found this in his wallet. And I'm saying, he still thinks of me that way. Uh, so I thought it was pretty good. But as, as I was growing up, my family, we, we didn't always connect or communicate very well. So a much younger <coughs> me got messages and I started to say to myself, when I failed the math test, I'm no good at math. If I failed social studies, I'm no good at social studies. I, I, I'm not good. And you begin to challenge yourself on every little thing. I'm so stupid. I have actually said that to myself. I shouldn't have even tried. It's my fault. Everything that goes wrong is my fault. And in creeps this thing called shame. Have you ever heard, uh, have you heard of Brene Brown? Yes. Prolific writer. And she has a book all about men, women, and, and worthiness is the, the title of it. And in it, she does a real good exploration of what happens to us when we form a shame bubble around ourselves. What happens to our social interactions? What happens to our communication? What happens to our relationships when we put shame around ourselves? And of course, being Brene Brown, what does she recommend? Learning about it, looking at it, learning how to dismantle it. And there are many ways you, to dismantle shame. Now, here's another question I get asked quite a bit. Do genders experience uh, failure differently? What do you think? <coughs> hmm? yes. they, do they experience failure difference, differently? I think they handle it differently. Exactly. That's what I see. Mm -hmm. They are, uh, males are taught in differently from females in terms of how to handle it. And I'll give you some, some examples of that in, in a minute. But that is the crux of sometimes the issue for us if we're raising girls or boys or we're interacting with males and females in our workplace. We respond to failure differently. And I shared how some, some of the ways that I 
particularly responded to it like it's my fault, I'm so dumb, I should have done that. Uh, but males, did, they respond in a very different way. Oops. This is a quick chart <coughs> of what we have learned about the differences between girls. Now, this is girls and boys and how they respond to failure. Girls are, are focused on what I can't do. I cannot do it, sometimes before they even try. And then boys are saying, well, I'm going to try it. I'm going to see if I can do this. Girls say, get the feedback of, well, you tried. See ya. Go, go away. And boys are, are told, try harder. Put some muscle into it. I knew you could do it. And if you, if you observe, especially in sports, how males and females get different messages about how they are to respond or they are, they are told about the value of their failure. These are the kinds of responses that, that you get. Uh, the setbacks are experienced as, I'm not good enough, and I'm not good enough for anything. After a while, that's where it goes. And boys are told, well, I'm just going to put some more muscle into it. Have you ever heard that? I'm going to just power through it. I'm just going to do it. And that's not the kind of message that females get. They're, in a way, my experience, kind of told, we're kind of told to, well, you couldn't do that, go find something else, or don't bother me anymore because you can't do it. And it's a very sad state for me, and with all the, the coaching that I've done, I still hear senior level women say, I've stopped trying. You ever hear anyone say that? I've just simply stopped trying. So the question becomes, what can we do about this for ourselves and for the, the women we work with and for the women in our family and our community? OK, one of the things that I wanted to do here. Anyone ever hear of the imposter syndrome? How many of you have heard imposter syndrome? OK, a fair, fair amount of you. Um, this is, and as we, we, we mature and we go into the workplace and we take on more and more responsibility, we might be caused to say, hmm, how did I get here? I know I did. When I, was, uh, when I was working for uh, a couple of very large banks in New York and when I got to Goldman Sachs, it was, what am I doing here? I'm just, I'm, I'm literally, literally a Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx. What am I doing here with these people from Harvard, from Yale, from all the great institutions, educational What am I doing here? They're going to figure out I don't belong. And that's the kind of dialogue, unfortunately, we, we sometimes engage in. And the key is to catch yourself when you're saying that. And I always ask myself when I, when I start talking to myself, I ask the question, what evidence do you have of that? What evidence do you have that people think you're, you're dumb? What, who's told you that? And I've actually had some people, you know, kind of stop in their tracks and say, well, well, now that you mention it, the imposter sy syndrome is between those two bubbles of sometimes we're so talented at doing something, say, saying something, accomplishing something, that we actually might make it look easy. So no big deal. Pfft, you ever do that? Oh, nothing. No, oh, pfft, no, build another, oh yeah, I can do that. No problem. I don't have to sleep. <laughs> so what I'm doing here is I'm deconstructing for us. That's one of my fav favorite words. Deconstructing for us what this failure 
that, we, that stops us in our tracks, what is it comprised of? And the imposter syndrome is absolutely one of those factors that can stop us in our tracks. Meanwhile, I'll ask the question again, what evidence do I have that I am as good as I know people know I am? Am I, how, what kind of evidence do I have to prove to myself, not to anybody else, to myself that I'm as good as I say I am? Oops. Man, technology today. One of the things with the work around emotional intelligence in the workplace uh, is around the neuroscience that support, uh, supports it. And I, I'm going to confess, I'm a neuroscience geek. I love reading about the brain and how it's connected, how it functions, what helps it, what hurts it. And one of the things that we know is that male and female brains, the actual structure of the brains, are different. They process, they, they process differently. They pay attention to things. We pay attention to things differently. You ever been with a man and you're noticing something happening over there and right over, I know my husband, right over his head. And, and then he says, I, I, I didn't see that. Well, <laughs> you're not me. Well, some of the key, some of the key differences, sorry guys, I'm like, eh, I'm going to hurl it out the window any second now. I don't like when things don't work for me. <laughs> The key thing to remember about the difference between male and, and female brains is that the female brain is an empathizing brain. We connect. We connect with people. We notice things that maybe might go past the eyes of someone else. We're also creative, of course, and collaborative. And one of the things we know is over the tens of thousands of years that humans have been on this, this earth, uh, women are the ones who were left to take care of the, the clan, the tribe, while men went over and, and did whatever they do. <laughs> but what we have learned is that that kind of natural behavior is embedded on, in us, in our brains. And it emerges very naturally in collaborative, excuse me, collaborative um, situations like the playground, like the office. Let's, you know, and literally, can't we just all get along is kind of the, the idea here. But with males, males look at one thing at a time. It's got to be sequential. It's got to be linear. It's a very different way of looking, and it's relevant in terms of looking at, um, con at conflict and looking at failure because it's not always recognized as being a linear uh, process. Men just go ahead and work on whatever is in front of them and do it in, in yeah, sometimes in a good way. Now, I would be remiss if I did not go forward and, and talk with you. Come on. All right. If I didn't talk with you about what helps us in terms of getting over either a fear of failure or trying to ignore the impact of failure, what can we do? So what helps? Four things help. You must form a fan club. <laughs> you do. You have to form a fan club. You have to find people who support you, who will sometimes tell you the truth, but they are always in your corner. And I think the most valuable thing I have learned from my fan club is they protect me from me.
because I will be the first one to go down the rabbit hole. So when I start to go down that, that rabbit hole, I have someone nearby very often or I'm talking to someone and, and they say, okay, so let's review your life, Pat. Let's talk about the successes that you've had. You did that well. You did that meeting well. You did that conference well. That is having someone in your corner. Get yourself a fan club, and I'll, I'll be honest with you. One of the major lessons I have learned around fan clubs, many, many years ago when I decided to leave the New York City Board of Education, I was a bilingual teacher in one of the worst neighborhoods in New York City, the, the South Bronx. And I got an opportunity to work in a company Wall, on Wall Street. And I was so excited. My, my husband and I had very close friends, Nick and Stephanie. And we would go out to the movies and all that. But w one weekend, I was so excited. I was kind of <laughs> tensed up and, oh, I'm going to tell. And so we go out after the movie, get some ice cream. I, I'm like, I can't hold it anymore. Stephanie, guess what? I'm going to take a job in a Wall Street firm and I'm going to be working and educating bankers and uh, techni technicians, and I'm so excited about it. Response, I will never forget that as long as li I live. And what makes you think that you can do that? OK. And that night when I said good night, I really meant goodbye. You have someone like that in your fan club, show them the door. I know sometimes that's very difficult, especially if they're related to you. It's very difficult. But nothing will eat at you faster, and nothing will keep you from succeeding and overcoming any feelings you have around failure if you have people who are feeding you that kind of, that kind of uh, input. The second thing that I would definitely recommend is, whoops, realize that there are two types of mindsets, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And this is based on the, the, uh, the work of uh, someone else, you know, if, if you can find any of her work, um, Dweck, Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K. And Dr. Dweck did a lot of research around there are qualities of people who succeed, consistently succeed. And what they have is a growth mindset. Yeah, I messed that up, but I will grow from it. Yeah, I guess I didn't, I didn't come up with the right answer, but I'll learn how to do it better. Versus the fixed mindset, which is what I showed you I grew up with. I failed, I'm stupid. That is a, grow, uh, a f fixed mindset. And it's catching yourself. And that's what you need your fan club for, to catch you, keep you safe from you. From you. The third thing I, I would suggest is realize when it doesn't look like you're going to succeed at something, you're, you're trying to to work something out, realize that you have alternatives. There are other actions, other things, other ways. You can accomplish your goal. So your job becomes, how else can I accomplish this goal? How else can I get this done? How many of you have been at a place like that where you, you said, all right, this, is, this path isn't going to work, but it, I need to think about something else? Of course you do. And that is the third most powerful way I've learned to be able to, to deal with a propensity to think about, I, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to No. There's another way to get this done. And the last thing, I love this kid. <laughs> Uh, you know, he's, he's on every meme that I, that I see, you know. And what do you think that fist means? Yeah. Hmm? 
I'm going to do it. It's, to me, this represents the quality of resilience. Again, that ability to jump on a trampoline that at first goes down and then bounces you back up because you know you can succeed at it, whatever it is. And there are, there are admittedly some, some dark moments there, but this, this little guy has, has taken me many times. I have a copy of him over my desk. And he's like, you can do it. You can do it. Come back. And that's how I found the, 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 sometimes the, the strength to keep going. Here's this next one. Come on. This is one of my favorite quotes about failure and success. The, and I believe that the, the most successful people are the ones who have failed the most. You have to think about Steve Jobs, who got fired from the company that he started. You think about J.K. Rowling, who went to, I think it was about like 14 different publishers and got rejected at each single one of those. Oprah Winfrey, who was fired from her first TV, show, uh, TV job. And that resilience, that ability to bounce back, is something that you have innately within you, that you can cultivate on an ongoing basis. And frankly, I like to copy people. You know, borrowing behaviors is, is a very good way to learn new behaviors. So you see someone doing something that you think will be useful to you in, in those si situations, you want to copy it. Copying is a good thing to do. That's something that one of my mentors told me. Have you read this book? You have. How many of you have seen this book, read this book? OK. There's going to be a rush on Amazon, I know, for this book. So Presence by uh, Amy Cuddy. Um, Amy Cuddy is a psychologist. I think she's from Yale or Harvard. I'm not quite sure. But she's done a lot of work about the power of your own body to help you get strong, to get, to get brave, frankly. As a matter of fact, let's, let's do one. Everybody stand up. Let's do one. Yeah. All right, everybody up. Think about something that's a challenge to you right now. Something that is a challenge to you. Assume the cutty position, hands and fists on the hips, legs spread out, <laughs> chest out. And we keep this position for 70 seconds. That's when it's been shown to really kick in. And think about how you're going to handle this latest challenge of yours. How can you do this? Are there are alternatives. Who will be in your fan club? Who will lift you up when you need it most? Oh, I'm getting chills. All I can say at this point is go get them, ladies. <laughs> I, we have time for questions. Any questions about what, any particular aspect of this or, or something you want to talk about? And I'll, I'll be around for the rest of the, yes? So, um, in times of failure, there's really, I see it as two pieces. One is like, how do you cope with it yourself? But then two, how, how have you helped others get mm -hmm. past the failure you've experienced? Or how can you share an experience? Oh, oh. Watch out on the phone again. Watch out your phone. Oh, your laptop. Oh, dear. That's what I get for talking with my hands. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sorry to disrupt, but you know, can you name a time or sh share an experience where you have, how have you owned up to it so that others can get past it or help in that? Owned up to a failure that I made? Yeah. Oh, sure. That was my first, second, and third business. 
I have failed in business three times. The first time I wound up owing over $100,000. Second time I, I had, and I'm, I'm reliving this of course, uh, <laughs> I, I had to let go of a staff member because I couldn't afford her anymore and she had just put her baby into the hospital for a surgery. I can't tell you how painful that was. And the third time, and I'll say it out loud, I had to declare bankruptcy. It's only by owning up to those things that, that I'm, I'm able to get through them. Now, I can explain, truthfully, I can explain, what's your, what's your name? Christy. Christy. I can explain anything away but I know what I own in here. And when I saw, when I knew what was going on with Angela and her baby, I was like, what, how am I gonna do this? How am I gonna take care of it? And I, do the very, I did the very best that I could, but my, mon my company was out of money and no one was willing to lend me any more, more money. So, there wasn't much I could do, except be there, tell the truth, uh, and just simply be with it. Um, I had a bottle of wine or two. <laughs> Adult beverages do help. <laughs> but it doesn't take away the shame. So I had to learn how to handle that shame, and my tribe, my fan club, helped me with it. And they remind me of the successes I've had along the way. Um, yes? Um, my is that, um, okay, say you were a successful first and then you failed on your butt, but now you about to be even bigger than what you was last time. The people that you thought was on your team, now they're mad at you. But when you was down, they was rooting for you. Mm -hmm. But now you about to come up and they angry, like, how do you deal with them? Like, okay, because, when I was under you, we was all go go, but now I'm about to pass you. You should be coming with me, and it's like you fighting against me. Like, how do you deal with those, those, those rules that you the door. But, but you know, but, but, but they be they was at you when you was with your lowest. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody don't left you. You're down they, here, they're up here, and then suddenly yeah. everything shifts. Yeah, but but the ones that you helped and took care of, they had already left you mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. got low. That person stood with you through it all, but now that you're about to pass them, it's like they're angry. And you're like, <coughs> when that happened, like, I don't understand that. Like, shouldn't you be on my team and we go together? Like, but. Well, I'm, thank you very much. That is a very potent <laughs> question. I want to open it up to everyone here. Anyone have any ideas, experiences around that? I, I certainly do, but. I want to hear from everybody. I have a very, very tight-knit, close group of women that I worked with who were extremely close. And um, we were all on the same level. As soon as I started rising, all of a sudden it turned. I couldn't, I didn't understand it. I was hurt, I was betrayed. It, it hurt harder than like, maybe losing yeah. your spouse or your somebody, because you're that close with these people. And it took me about a decade to realize and, and to accept that it's not the kind of people I need in my life. And they weren't, even though we were all together and tight knit and when we were all down and you know, we, we were together through hard times. But as soon as, even though they were with you then, if they can't be with you now, just realizing that that's not the type of people, that's not healthy, that's not your fan club, it's hard, it took a decade, and it still hurts when I see them on Facebook or I see them mm -hmm. around, it mm -hmm. hurts, but it's something I had to accept anyway. So you left them behind? Yes. You closed the door on that? Yeah. Any other, uh, yes? I, I actually personally believe that everybody has a season or reason in your life, and, in your life. and um, unfortunately there are people that you're going to outgrow. 
There's going to be careers you're going to outgrow. There's going to be situations, <clears throat> marriages are going to outgrow. I mean, that's just part of life. So if you get to that place where someone now makes you feel uncomfortable because you're moving ahead and you're growing, then I think you need to show that person the door as well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that can lead you to some hindrance for yourself mm -hmm. as you're thinking of that of person. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. don't beat yourself up. Yeah, and, and I, I happen to agree with that, that statement that people and things have a reason and a season. And coming and accepting that is part of the growth cycle that we have to go through. There's no denying that it's painful. Um, there's no denying that you still sting every once in a while. And put the putting a, 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 some salve on that, knowing that you're better because of the interaction you had with them. Think about, actually, this is something I did once. I thought about this woman who I, I moved my family to work for her. And it didn't work out so, so very well. It was actually very, very challenging. And um, I had to stop and say, okay, you took something away from me, but what did I get from you? What did I learn from you? What did you teach me? And you come from a perspective then of gratitude, which, and gratitude is a very healing state to be in. That makes sense? Yes. Any other questions yeah. or comments? Yes. I just wanted to add, uh, what's your name? Debbie. Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Hi. Um, I would say something that I do that helps me is when you're developing relationships, you have to find out, and sometimes people, you know, I guess they don't want to do this, but you have to be strategic with the people that you place in your life. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose that each person mm. that comes into your life, what do they serve, you see? Because the thing is, when you learn early on what their purpose is, at the end of it, when they start to kind of dissipate, then it may not be as harsh. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, you may have leveled up and left them behind, and you're ahead, but maybe that was the purpose all along. That was for them to push you to the front. Mm -hmm. And it's no hard feelings, no matter what happened and however you got to where you had, you know, to get to. Um, something I live by is, it doesn't matter how you get to where you need to get to, as long as you got there. Mm -hmm. Could you say that again? What? It doesn't matter where you get to, how you got to get to, but how you got there. Absolutely. Does that help? Oh, yes, ma'am. I'll help. Good. You have I actually have a question, if I could. Um, you talk about failures. I own up to too many failures publicly, mm -hmm. and then it puts that thought into other people's minds, but it's almost like I'm trying to call out the failures so you can't call me out. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced that? Do you have any feedback for that? How do you... I have a hard time, in an example, I'm presenting something and there's a number off, or it just, uh, I, I, corporate America and I deal with numbers all day long, and mm. I'm the first one, my boss will be happy to call me out, so I try to call myself out before, and even when I'm not on the phone with him and I'm on the phone with others, I, I find this, that I own up to failures very quickly, and... And they are, they are your failures. That's not a failure, that's a mistake. Right. Uh, right. Give that woman a prize. <laughs> That's exactly what I would... I own up to mistakes that then draw attention to the mistake, and that's what people remember, not the hundred wonderful things I did on the call. They remember the one mistake that the, I've called out. Yeah, well, stop pointing it out. It's easier said than done, guys. It's just... I, I think they said it in the seminar that women have a problem in tooting their own horn. Mm -hmm. and I think we need to learn how to do that more yeah. for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Maybe focus less on and, and just emphasize on, on all the good things that you did. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you did tons of great things. Exactly. Right? I, if, if it takes you or someone from your fan club, to, that's why you always want to have someone at, you know, kind of protecting your flanks. <laughs> you want to have someone in the room with you that says, 
Oh yeah, that was a, that was an error. That was a mistake. But you know what we really learned from this is look at the bottom line. We're positive now. That that's what you want your fan club to do for you. And you need a fan club in your work, in your your family, in your community. You want that fan club to to be there to point out what worked. Should you expect or should you? going after your boss being your fan club? To have your ba your boss as part of your fan club? Right. Because you just said you needed somebody on your flanks. And, and he's going to call me out in front of anyone. Am I in a bad situation with that? And I need to find a new boss? Not a boss necessarily, but like you just want another coworker. I think you're in a bad situation. Oh, I think that's where you can approach it with gratitude as well, is if it's something that bothers you, is have a conversation with him and approach it directly. Like, I know, you know, I noticed that I tend to do this, and I don't want it to take away from my work. Can you help me with it? And I found that's really effective, especially with men, is ask them for their help. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think you're good? I am darn good. You are darn good. I darn good. I, and I, I can tell you that I've seen my peers that have come up, and the same feedback's not given because they're not going to be able to rise to the same level. Hmm. So originally, I was the only person he had to give feedback to. So I was like, OK, he's just being hard on me because he wants me to improve. Once I saw that it's not being consistent. But again, I guess the message that I'm trying to point out is that we teach people how to perceive us, right? Or we, we teach people how to treat us. How to treat us, but also if we put out our failures or things that are not mistakes or perfect or whatever, sometimes that's what people take away. And how do you overcome that? Besides not doing it. <laughs> well, I would say you have to be strategic about when you point something out. Uh, you have to think about what are, are the consequences. Uh, of my pointing out this particular thing. How, do, how does it reflect on me? How will it influence how people consider, if people consider me for other opportunities or other positions? Ladies, I am so sorry, but guess what? We're done. Thank you so much.